first reading is from Acts 2, verses 1 to 21. While the day of Pentecost was running its course, they were all together in one place, when suddenly there came from the sky a noise like that of a strong driving wind, which filled the whole house where they were stirring. And there appeared to them tongues like flames of fire, dispersed among them and res resting on each one. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to talk in other tongues, as the Spirit gave them the power of utterance. Now there were living in Jerusalem devout Jews drawn from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the crowd gathered, all bewildered, because each one heard his own language spoken. They were amazed and in their astonishment exclaimed, Why, they are all Galileans, are they not, these men who are speaking? How is it that when we hear them, then each one of them hears in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, inhabitants of Mesopotamia, of Judea and Cappadocia, of Pontus and Asia, of Perigia and Pamphylia, of Egypt and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them telling in our own tongue the great things God has done. And they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what can this mean? Others said contemptuously, they have been drinking. But Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, mark this and give me a hearing. These men are not drunk as you imagine, for it is only nine in the morning. No, this is what the prophet spoke of. God says, that will happen in the last days. I will pour out upon everyone a portion of my spirit and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your men, young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Yes, I will endue even my slaves, both men and women, with a portion of my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the sky above and signs on the earth below blood and fire and drifting smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before that great resplendent day. The day of the Lord shall come and then everyone who invokes the name of the Lord shall be saved. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians or chapter 12, verses 4 to 13. Reading from 1 Corinthians. There are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are many forms of work, but all of them, in all men, are the work of the same God. In each of us, the Spirit is manifested in one particular way, for some useful purpose. One man through the Spirit has a gift of wise speech, while another, by the power of the same Spirit, can put the deepest knowledge into words. Another by the same spirit is granted faith. Another by the one spirit gifts of healing and another miraculous powers. Another has the gift of prophecy and another ability to distinguish, distinguish true spirits from false. Yet another has the gift of ecstatic utterance of different kinds and another the ability to interpret it. But all these gifts are the work of one and the same spirit, distributing them separately to each individual at will. For Christ is like a single body with its many limbs and organs, which many as they are together make up one body. For indeed we were all brought into one body by baptism in the one spirit, whether we are Jews or Greeks whether slaves or free men, and that one Holy Spirit was poured out for all of us to drink. Happy Pentecost, everybody. That's such an inspiring name, isn't it? it and it only means 50 days. I mean, it doesn't really mean at all what Pentecost is all about. We should call it Spirit Day. 
do you think? You're not sure whether I'm serious or not, are you? Because you're thinking, how dare you challenge 2,000 years of church tradition, calling it Pentecost. The story of Pentecost is really quite straightforward. Um, the Spirit comes to the disciples and inspires them to force large numbers of people to sit in pews facing forward in a large room at which they will listen to somebody stand at the front and drone on incessantly about something that probably isn't terribly relevant to their daily lives. <laughs> Had to think about it for a minute. Again, you're not sure if I'm kidding, are you? Because that's what we, that is what we did. What the, the church became was people sitting in a large building in straight pews facing the front listening to somebody talk about something that was written thousands of years ago, and usually in a way that was not terribly relevant to today. We changed it a bit. A bit, not always a lot. We changed that a bit. But that wasn't what the church was supposed to be. It wasn't what it started out as. You know, we, we, we love, I, I think there are things about this story we really, like this would make a great movie, wouldn't it? Well, you know, special effects and everything. Right? The, the spirit comes as wind and fire, both things that have great power and energy, and coincidentally, the ability to destroy. But they have great power and energy, and so Pentecost is about the spirit being, being fully spirited, right? We have energy, we have enthusiasm, like that first hymn we sang. <laughs> the four or five people who are actually singing it. And, uh, but that's what, that's what the, it's about. The story's about, isn't it? Like wind and fire. Oh, that's awesome. That's cool. No. Actually, I think that's incidental. I don't think that's the most important part of the story. The most important part of the story is what they did with that. The most important part of the story is they talked to people. Now, in, in the story, it says, and let's not get confused here. They did not speak in tongues. They didn't. The tongue part of this story is at the beginning when it's the tongues of flame. When they spoke to people, they spoke in different languages. It says in the story that everyone who was there, regardless of where they were from, and remember, it was a holy festival, so people were in Jerusalem from all over the place. Wherever they were from, people could hear the disciples talking to them in their own language, their own familiar home language. That was the talking that they did. It was amazing. It was like the universal translator on Star Trek. Whatever anybody says, you can instantly understand it. No. <laughs> it's a metaphor, isn't it? It really isn't it. It's a metaphor, just like the wind and flame is a metaphor for the energy and the power of the Spirit. The fact that they could suddenly speak everyone's language, it's not about that. It's about communication. It's about how the Spirit inspired them to communicate, to connect with people. So hang on to that thought for just a second because I'm going to have a little rant now. Uh, earlier this week, uh, and you'll think at first this is not even remotely connected. But earlier this week, I was in a meeting in which somebody said that our church was tolerant. They thought our church was pretty tolerant. Actually, they might have said more tolerant than most or pretty tolerant, generally speaking, or something like that. But since they used the word tolerant, I wasn't really paying attention after that. Uh, because we are not tolerant. Please don't be tolerant. Pause. Jesus never taught tolerance. Jesus was never tolerant of people. Jesus never encouraged you to be tolerant of others. Ever. All Jesus ever asked you to do was love. All Jesus ever did was love. Here's what's wrong with being tolerant when it comes to people. Tolerant implies that there is something to be tolerant of. And again, 
Jesus did not ask you to be tolerant. Jesus asked you to love, no matter what. When we talk about being tolerant, it implies that there is something to be tolerant of. You may well be tolerant of the fact that the minister talks too long. But hey, you like the people at church, so you'll come. You may be tolerant of the fact that during the summer there's a lot of construction on highways, um, and so when you go on your vacation, you sometimes get stuck in traffic. But hey, you're going to get to the mountains sooner or later, so you'll be tolerant of that. And they need to do it. It's got to get done. You can be tolerant of that. Jesus never taught you to be tolerant of another person. Think about this. The moment you talk tolerance of another person, you're implying there's something about that person to be tolerant of. You have already started to build the wall that will separate you. Your perspective has become, this person has different, is different than me, and there is something about them that's different that I don't like. I'm going to be tolerant. And, and you might think, hey, that's a good thing, though, isn't it? Except it isn't, because what tolerance does is put that person over there and go, I'm not going to engage that. I'm just going to disagree with it. I'm going to agree to disagree, and we're just going to leave that. I'll be tolerant. Jesus never asked you to be tolerant. Jesus asked you to love. And love is engagement. Love says that person's different. I will embrace them. Not that person's different. I can put up with that a little bit because maybe, you know, maybe they'll change or maybe, you know, you are already creating us and them. And you, nothing will happen with that other than building on us and them. Jesus taught love, not tolerance, because love is engagement. Love reaches out. Love connects with people. Here's how the Spirit moves you to do that. It's in the story, isn't it? The very first thing that the disciples did with the Spirit was communicate, was try and connect with people. Did it work 100%? No, some people thought they were drunk. I wonder if they tolerated that. Because that way they wouldn't have to listen to the message. They wouldn't have to listen to what the disciples were saying. They're drunk. We'll put up with it, but, you know, they should really sober up and say the right things at the right time, just like we do. Love is about engagement. The Spirit moves us to engage people, to build relationships, to explore those things that are different, to celebrate those things that are different. Because something else happens when we do that that Paul very quickly identified. We are, we are better as one. We are. When you see different, different gifts in people, when we engage those gifts when we celebrate those gifts, even if we don't understand them at first, even if we don't like them at first, doesn't mean we can't engage them. doesn't mean we can't be part of it. Because when we do that, we create this. Right? You've heard, you've heard me say before that being, feeling welcomed in a community, feeling part of, the, of a community, isn't just about feeling like you belong because you agree with everybody. It's about feeling like what you bring that's unique and distinct helps the community be more than it is without you. And that people recognize and appreciate that. That's when you really start to feel welcome. It's not just about fitting in. We need all the parts. And this is where, this is where he's going. Every, every year we hear part of this little piece in Corinthians, and it's long, by the way. It goes on quite a bit. But we hear part of this bit about how we are one body with many members. This is a piece we hear this year about how the Spirit in, inspires all of these unique gifts in us that our, our sense of oneness, and I know I've been on the oneness thing for a few weeks now, but our sense of oneness is empowered by the Spirit. We are one body. Do you tolerate your left hand? Do you tolerate your right earlobe? Do you tolerate your, your left big toe? 
What about your right knee? I know what you're thinking right away. No, actually, I don't tolerate that. I, too, have to look in the mirror in the morning, and yes, it's scary. But that isn't the spirit. That's our perception of ourselves based on what? What society thinks. We have our ideas of what's, uh, what's uh, beautiful, what's handsome, what's... Uh, well, we've even made them gender-specific, too. Um, we have our own ideas based on what society thinks of what might be beautiful or attractive. And because we're not that, we simply have to tolerate our appearance. What happened to loving yourself because you're you? Oh, man, I sound like Oprah uh, suddenly. But, but don't dismiss that because that's what this is about. You don't tolerate your appearance. You don't tolerate whether or not your body works as well as other people's. You don't tolerate that. You love it. You have to. You have to love it, because how else will you live one of the most important things that Jesus teaches? To love your neighbor as yourself. You can't love your neighbor if you don't already love yourself. You need to love yourself. All your parts, the ones you can see, the ones that you can't, the ones that work the way they're supposed to, that we think they're supposed to, and the ones that don't. You need to love them. In our communities, you need to love them, not tolerate them. Wow, I even said it as them, didn't I? This is the power of Pentecost. It's not about wind and fire. It's about connection. It's about being inspired to build relationship. It's about being inspired to love. That's the power of the Spirit. We, that's sometimes how we describe it even, that the Spirit, it, when you talk about God being God, uh, Jesus, and the Spirit, the Trinity, right? Oh, sorry, I can't really talk about that because that's next Sunday. Um, Trinity Sunday. That's the, the only thing about Trinity Sunday. We get to talk about the Trinity because the Trinity's not actually in the... Bu Never mind, I'll tell you next week. <laughs> the, the thing is, the Spirit, we traditionally understand the Spirit as the power of God at work in the world. Why? Because we have this wonderful story about how the Spirit came upon the disciples. Hang on a second. How is that possible? Didn't the resurrected Jesus appear to the disciples and breathe upon them the gift of the Holy Spirit? How is it possible that the Spirit only just now appeared? In fact, if the Spirit has been since the beginning, as has Jesus and God, how is it possible it only just appeared now? I don't think it only just appeared now. I think we only recognized it now. I think we only recognized it because we saw what I, what I just said to the, the kids. We had all these stories of Jesus, all these teaching of Jesus. What are you going to do with that? When you have a great story, what do you do with it? Do you sit at home and go, wow, that's great. Sorry, I really enjoyed that. That's super. Or do you tell everyone you know that they should read that book or see that show or that movie or... You tell them that great story. Why? Two reasons. One is so they'll know, and just as important, the joy you get in telling it. That's the spirit. That's the spirit at work. The spirit moves us to tell the story. The spirit moves us to share the story. And what is the story all about? It's not about tolerance. It's about love. It's about engaging people, whoever they are, however they are. Even more so if they are different. And they will be different because we're all unique. We're all different. What makes us one is the power of the Spirit moving us to love and embrace each other. 
It's not about tolerance, it's about love. That's what Pentecost is all about. Did the disciples have 100% success? N not even right away, right? But even as they went out into the world, even as people shared that story, what happened to the story? Well, sometimes people didn't hear it. Sometimes the manner in which it was shared was not particularly empowering. Sometimes the story was used to do other things. We can fix that. We can. We can embrace the power of the Spirit to love and understand that from the very first moment, it is about love. It's not about building th walls that will separate us. It's not about pushing people away. It's not about setting aside a difference because you just don't want to have to deal with that. Dive in. The Spirit goes with you. We are many, many members of one body. We need all the parts, and we need all the parts to connect. That's how we're one in Christ.